Hi, welcome to New America's Video Blog. I'm your host, Jim Jockel. Joining me today, Kevin McPartland, Managing Director of Greenwich Associates. Kevin, how are you? Great, how are you? I want to talk a little bit about fintech and banking, right? So, you know, obviously, you know, you you, you troll LinkedIn and, and Twitter and everything else, and all the rage is digitalization, automation. How do I partner with fintech companies? And one of the things that I find most interesting is finally, you know, uh, McKinsey's come out and said there's 80 sectors of different areas of fintech, uh, ranging from mobile and payments and digital banks all the way through capital markets transformation. But, you know, perhaps uh, the first question to you is, does it make sense for a bank to become an IT company? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a great question. I mean, banks need technology to do their business. The only way they're going to remain relevant and um, re retain their market share is with an underpinning of technology to make the user experience more efficient. I think that goes from uh, the retail audience all the way up to the institutional level. Now, I, I guess the question is, how do they do that? You know, should they uh, staff and, and, and run like a technology firm with hundreds of programmers, and all that comes along with that, or should they look to partner firms who are software companies to help them create and build that infrastructure? Uh, I mean, the, re the right answer in the end is probably somewhere in between, um, but I suspect we'll see different banks take, take different directions. But it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But this is also not a new trend. I mean, we I think going back, we've seen this in the 90s. We've seen, you know, spin outs, let's, uh, you know, risk metrics. We've seen, you know, uh, MSCI, things of that nature. So, you know, is it a, are we, is history repeating itself in some a cases? A little bit. I mean, so I had my first job, I graduated from school with a computer science degree in the late 90s and joined JP Morgan in technology and that was a time um, probably the only reason I got that job was because they were so desperate for programmers back then because the banks really wanted to invest in technology they saw this was the next big thing um, the dot-com bubble burst and banks said, wait a second actually you know what we're bankers we're not technologists we should maybe we shouldn't do this um, and they shifted their their sites out you know outside and we saw this great big boom in all of these institutional um, tech providers. But you're right, so now I think we're almost circling back as the banks are starting to sell technology and spin off technology and buy technology and tr try to integrate it into their platforms um, because they see where, you know, where the world is moving. Um, so I, I don't think we're at any equilibrium yet. I think everybody is still trying to you know, flesh out what works in the long term. But uh, so uh, I guess the question is, are there areas that make sense versus areas that, that perhaps don't make sense. You know, like, um, you know, obviously, I, I think right now you're starting to see more regulation in, in terms of the payment space of where, do this, where does the bank in, uh, end and the fintech uh, partner begin. But, you know, when you go into more institutional kind of platforms and things of that nature, um, you know, uh, like, um, you know, uh, J.P. Morgan trying to monetize Athene or Goldman Sachs giving away its trading platform or a version of it uh, in SecDB, you know, are there areas that make sense and others that don't? Yeah, I mean, payments is a good example because payments, in the end, banks, um, a big part of what they do is help people move money around. Um, it's, it's no uh, surprise that the existing, like if you wire money or you need to do a transfer, the fact that it can take a couple of days is crazy given today's technology. It's not that way in other countries like it is in the U.S. So um, it, it's great that we've seen so much innovation in that space, but ultimately the banks owning the payments infrastructure because that's so core to what they do, th that over time makes sense. Um, when you start to talk more about tools and analytics and risk management, um, you know, do they need to own that technology? I, I think there's parts of the secret sauce, especially for institutional investors, where they feel like it's a competitive advantage, um, but for parts that are, are less of a competitive advantage and more just a requirement, it seems like you know the more cost-efficient way forward would be to work with outside providers. Well, you know, it, it's interesting. One of the things, and I know you, you cover a lot on the buy side, um, one of the barriers that I hear about these types of large platforms is giving up my data, showing my positions, you know, um, who's going to have access to that? And that's always been kind of a, a long-standing battle uh, of, of owning your own data. But on the buy side, you see cloud adoption, hosted services, a, a less of a fear in terms of engaging technologies. Uh, how much, you know, what were, how did those firms overcome their challenges or, or fear or just 
the nature of what we do and this is the tool I have. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it got to a point where the, um, the reduced costs and the efficiencies outweighed the concerns. And I think we've seen over time as we've used things like cloud and more in our personal life, you start to get a trust there. Um, and that has sort of come over into the, into the work environment. If we think about the big cloud providers, Amazon, Microsoft, um, Google, their whole business is predicated on keeping, um, keeping those platforms up and running and 110% secure. And you know, we could argue about whether or not a bank is better at securing their data center than one of these cloud providers are, um, but I would, I would tend to think that the cloud providers, given that's all they do, um, you know, we should feel safe at we this have, point. We haven't heard about any Russian hacks of uh, AWS or Amazon at this point, but you know, you do hear you know, hacks on private data centers. Yeah, right, so, so it's on everybody's mind, but I think, um, I mean, maybe this is a good example where you know, why don't you outsource it to the experts? Focus on your core business and let, um, let the security folks focus on security. And I think, you know, the other big holdback has always been concern, uh, compliance concerns or concerns that regulators will be nervous that, you know, your customer data is with a third party. I think we've been getting past that, especially as we're seeing U.S. regulators themselves using cloud computing. So, uh, so how does management stay focused? You know, when I sit back and I, and, I, and I get my budget and I look at the line item of how much I'm investing in technology, <laughs> whether it's regulatory driven or competitive driven, staying in the league tables, or even down in terms of keeping, keeping market share from small startups, there's always that innate way of saying, well, how do I monetize this in some way? How does, how does management take a measured approach when looking at these line items? Yeah, I mean, it's always going to be back to return on investment, which I think is why certain technologies that seem so obvious that they are the way forward, why they can take so long to be adopted on Wall Street, because maybe your back office systems are 25 years old and they run on a mainframe, um, and it, how could we run on a mainframe anymore? But it works, um, it's efficient, it's, uh, it's robust, and it would cost us $25 million in the next two quarters to pull it out. We don't want to take a $25 million hit for, for what looks like, at least in the medium term, not much of an improvement, so let's leave it. Um, those projects do slowly bubble up to the top and eventually are realized they need to be replaced and the benefits do outweigh the upfront costs. But it's a, it's a slow process because in the end it is, it's about return on investment and that's, that's going to be the metric. Not um, Banks don't look to technology because they're cool, they look to technology because it can help them make more money. And you bring up, you know, legacy technologies, and we, we, you know, we hear this, you know, all of the time when there's so much cool stuff out. There's so much uh, new and innovative stuff. Um, you know, where, how does, how do banks jump in? Uh, you know, is it, is it a point-to-point -point type solution of, um, you know, here's a, here's a market I need to, uh, where I see a market with opportunity, so let me figure that out, and, oh, well, it doesn't work with this 25-year-old stuff, but we'll fix it on the back end. You know, how, yeah. how is at some point, that stuff is going to break. Sure, the, especially the bulge bracket banks. I mean, they do. They have you know hundreds, if not thousands, of people looking at each and every element day to day. Um, you know, the biggest global universal banks have so many different parts of their business. You know, r you know, retail banking, commercial lending, investment banking, trading. It's just, I mean, the, the list goes on and on. And yeah, they have experts in each case looking at those areas, trying to make sure that they're competitive. Um, you know, the jobs of the, the CEOs of those big banks that have um, so many irons in the fire, um, you know, they, they, they earn their paycheck, in my opinion. It's a complex animal that they have to keep an eye on. But um, I think the, think the way they do it is by hiring smart people that do keep an eye and, and make sure that uh, if there's an opportunity, they get involved. Uh, uh, and if, it, if it's a fad, they make sure that they, uh, they stay away and, and save, the, save, the, save the cash. Very good. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for uh, your insight on this debate because uh, it's going to obviously be keep continuing. It's not going anywhere. Please check out his blog and um, website. produces great research on GreenwichAssociates.com, and you can also follow him on, on LinkedIn. And, of course, we want to talk about the topics you want to talk about. Follow us on LinkedIn and on Twitter at NX Analytics. I'm Jim Jockel. Thanks for joining.